think it was October 2002 when uh, we endorsed Kibaki. We made that decision as an organization, uh, as a corporate organization, as a citizen, uh, that we thought this was the best thing to do. It was just a moment of tremendous joy and achievement when uh, Khan was routed in the elections. Kenyans, I think, were recorded or polled as the most optimistic citizens in the world. We may not be able to say that today. And the bureaucracy certainly hadn't changed, very large areas of government hadn't changed, but there was uh, optimism about what could be achieved in terms of, uh, you know, uh, reducing corruption, fighting against corruption. But as time went on, and this was very quickly, that the situation began to deteriorate until you had your Anglo leasing, which was, you know, the Kibaki version of Moi's Goldenberg. So we discovered that, in fact, our job had not been done. Dynamics changed. The, the advocacy was no longer a question of just protesting. So the time had come to expand the work of the Kenyan Human Rights Commission into economic, social and cultural rights. Flower farms, for example, uh, and the EPZ zones were examples of this, where we expanded to make sure that worker rights were not violated. But we also knew that the KHRC itself um, could not replace the voice of the people. We began to reflect on how to begin to uh, position the Commission differently in terms of programming, begin to look for a roadmap that would help us in programming economic, social and cultural rights. So we identified uh, six communities uh, from around the country, one in Fika, uh, one in, uh, in Nakuru, working with the Ogiek community. Uh, in, in, in Thika we had two groups, there was the Ndula. Ndula, the main issue was uh, community struggles uh, around the existence of the Del Monte pineapple plantation. And then in Makongeni there were issues about uh, workers' rights violations, uh, Thika being an industrial, uh, industrial town. And then uh, we had uh, another group in Korogocho, it was uh, grappling with issues um, to do with uh, police repression, uh, arbitrary arrests and so forth. And in Kangemi, we, we had a group that also grappling with uh, similar issues as uh, in Korogocho. And then we had a group in, uh, in Ogunja, uh, community groups in Ogunja, that were grappling mainly with issues of um, uh, disinheritance, dispossession of, uh, of widows uh, of their property rights and, and, and land rights. So we came, we, we came with these six and uh, they were actually the germinal, the, 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 the germinal area that the, the, the regional human rights networks were born. We're sort of trying to hear what are your experiences in terms of struggle, in ter terms of things that constrain your right to dignity, your right to a livelihood, your right to um, health, your right to education, and trying to translate what they were demanding into, okay, what is the long-term institutional policy legal change that needed to happen? Our big strategy then was training. Because we said, uh, build capabilities for these guys to be able to investigate violations when they happen and do something about them. Build capabilities for them to uh, encourage learning and awareness within their communities, to inspire, to organize their communities to respond when human rights violations happen. It was a clear message that um, to root human rights in communities was the most sustainable way. It's like um, an investment that um, you cannot say that you will have a permanent state of fighting for human rights if people themselves don't, do not wake up and fight for their rights. Those human rights networks have become nuclear for movements, for rights that is emerging from the bottom. Today, I think when one can legitimately talk of uh, the Hakietu culture that is growing.